We spent a lot of time on the own price elasticity of demand. We're going to be able to finish up the rest of this topic in pretty quick order, given, given what we established with the own price elasticity of demand, right? So we're going to move on and we're going to talk about the second of our demand elasticities, the income elasticity of demand. Again, this is the notation that I'm going to use, E with a D subscript and INC, but Another common one that you might see for notation is this 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 uh, Greek letter eta. So what are we doing first? Let's define it. The income elasticity of demand is the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percent change in income. So notice on this, there is not absolute values. The income elasticity of demand, it could be positive, it could be negative, right? And whether it's positive or negative communicates something about the way we classify it. So if we have an own price, or sorry, an income elasticity of demand that's greater than zero, those are goods that we refer to as normal goods. Do you recall what's the definition of a normal good in this class? When we have that the income elasticity of demand is greater than zero it means something about this ratio, right? Our income elasticity is the ratio of these two percentage changes. It's gonna be positive two cases. Number one, if we have a positive number in our numerator divided by a positive number in our denominator, or alternatively, if we have a negative number in our numerator and a negative number in our denominator. Either way, what do we see? We see that there is, when income increases, quantity demanded also increases, or when income decreases, quantity demanded decreases. It sounds like um, when the income elasticity of demand is greater than zero, we're looking at a direct relationship between income and quantity demanded. Hey, doesn't that sound a lot like the way we defined normal goods earlier? When we defined normal goods earlier, we said that they were, um, when there is a direct relationship between income and demand. So let's consider a normal good to the right, and let's consider an increase in the income for a normal good. An increase in income for a normal good is gonna take the demand curve and it's gonna shift it to the right. Well, what we can do is we can say for a given price, oof, not yellow, for a given price, this was my original quantity demanded, and now when demand increases, this is how much quantity demanded has increased by. That area right here, this change in quantity demanded, that's what's being measured in the vertical, or in the vertical, in the numerator of this fraction, right? So we figure out what's the change in income. And for normal goods, we know um, that an increase in income is gonna shift a normal good to the right. But what the elasticity tells us is how much. Remember, the important question for elasticity is not increase or decrease, but it's how much of an increase or decrease. That's measuring how much of an increase in the quantity demanded for a given value of price, right? So the size, that when it's positive, it's saying that the income and demand move in the same direction. The size of the number communicates how much quantity demand it changes by. We're going to introduce a little bit extra terminology here. If the income elasticity of demand is greater than one, we have a spe special name for those kinds of goods. We're going to refer to those goods as luxury goods, right? Up to this point, we've used the term luxury and necessity very, very loosely, but now we want to formally say that luxury goods are goods with an income elasticity of demand that's greater than one, meaning that when income goes up, there is a greater percentage change in the quantity demanded for those kinds of goods. Um, alternatively, the last one, if, if, if the income elasticity of demand is negative, which it can be because we're not taking the absolute value, it means that the sign of the percentage change in the numerator and denominator are opposite, right? They're moving in opposite directions. If income goes up, demand and thus quantity demanded going down, that's absolutely how we define inferior goods. Right? So again, this income elasticity of demand, yes, whether it's positive or negative, tells me whether a good is normal or inferior. But in addition to that, the size of the value communicates how much of an impact income has on quantity demanded. The larger the elasticity, the more responsive consumers are to a change in their income. 
Another elasticity we can consider is this cross price elasticity of demand. And so I'm going to use um, XY for the two different goods um, and I'm going to do ED. You might also see sigma be used a lot um, is a common notation that gets used a lot. This is where we define economic substitutes and economic complements. And again, no absolute value with this formula. So this thing's going to be either, this calculation is going to either produce a positive or a negative value. One of them's for the complements. One of them are for the substitutes. Let's try to figure out what it is. So the structure of this thing in my denominator, I've got the price of the other good, the price of good Y. And in my numerator, I've got the quantity demanded like before, but this is the quantity demanded of my primary market, my prime, my quantity demanded of good X. So it's saying that when the other uh, price of a related good, either complement or substitute changes, what's going to happen to the quantity demanded of good X, right? So, and again, I'd encourage you as you, you get ready for the exam that covers this section, you might want to think about an example of, of two goods who are economic substitutes or who are economic complements, right? So um, what's a good, um, we've got strawberries and blueberries are I think what we used earlier for, um, for, the, for the substitutes, let's change that rather than eBooks, right? Strawberries, if this is the market for strawberries, then recall, this is the demand for strawberries, this is the quantity of strawberries, this is the price of strawberries, and somewhere else in a different market, there's a market for blueberries and something's happened in that market to drive up the price of blueberries. If blueberries go up in price, then notice we're going to have in our denominator a positive value. If they're economic substitutes, when the price of blueberries goes up, it's going to push consumers towards the strawberry market and we're going to see an increase in the demand for strawberries. How much of an increase? Remember, elasticity is really telling us how much, how much of an increase in strawberries. That's what, and that's how far the demand curve shifts to the right. Again, at a given price, quantity demanded of strawberries. When demand shifts right, that right there horizontally is how much the quantity demanded of strawberries changes, and that's the thing that we're being that's being measured in the vertical, the vertical, the numerator. I don't know why I keep doing that, right? So again, we've got positive change in the price of blueberries is going to produce a positive change in quantity demanded. How much is going to be is going to determine the size of this elasticity. If that if a strawberries are barely affected, I might have a very very small positive number. If they're very very closely related, and we've got a whole bunch of movement into this into this strawberry market, then my numerator is going to be a larger number, right? Regardless, I've got two different options here. This one, if the cross price elasticity of demand is positive, that's what I have when I have economic substitutes, right? And so double check for yourself. Think about what's a good complement and two goods who are good economic complements and convince yourself that, yep, they move in the opposite direction. For a complement, if the price goes up, it's going to push down the demand. And so our cross price elasticity of demand is going to be a negative value. I want to step back and do a very, very big picture, right? So I've got in my own price elasticity of demand versus my income versus my cross price elasticity of demand and the own price elasticity of demand. My denominator is the goods own price in the income elasticity of demand incomes in the denominator in the cross price elasticity. It's the price of the other good, right? And again, for the own price elasticity of demand, it's got quantity demanded in the numerator, the income elasticity of demand again, has quantity demanded in the numerator. The cross price elasticity of demand has quantity demanded in the numerator. So without looking, could you, based on that little uh, set of logic that it looks like these follow, could you come up with an equation that describes the own price elasticity of supply? So more than likely, the own price elasticity of supply, you probably guessed that it was something own price elasticity of supply. This is the notation we're going to use. Yep. So it's an own price. So that means my denominator is probably going to be something like the change in price. 
but it's the own price elasticity of supply. So all of these other ones up here were of demand and they had QD in their numerator. If it's the supply, percent change in quantity supplied. But a question, do you think there should be absolute value or should not be absolute value? Ah, that's, a, that's another great question for you to think about. What do we know about supply curves? The one thing we need to know about supply curves, right? Again, on the left, on the right, both totally legitimate supply curves. What do they need to be legitimate? They have to be upward sloping. I've got a very, very flat supply curve and I have a very steep supply curve. Both of them are upward sloping. What's important to know about a supply curve? It's important to know that what happens if prices start going up in a market, producers will try to ramp up production. They'll try to ramp up the quantity they supply to the market. On the right, for this steeper demand curve, let's take away some of those, for the steeper demand curve, right? Prices ramped up a lot. Producers still tried to ramp up production. They just found it more difficult, right? So a lot of what we're going to talk about with the own price elasticity of supply mimics what we had with the own price elasticity of demand. Notice I've got an equation and no, I do not use the absolute values, um, right? Is it clear why I'm not using the absolute values? Think about for the own price elasticity of demand, though the numerator and the denominator were always opposite signs, but for the own price elasticity of supply, those two values are always, always, always going to be the same, right? So my, my number is always going to be a positive number. I don't need the absolute value. But some of these classifications are going to look familiar. If the own price elasticity of uh, oof, own price elasticity, not of demand, but of supply. If it is greater than one, we call those elastic. Between these two pictures, is it clear which is the more elastic supply? Elastic supply is the flatter of the two supply curves. Just like for demand, the flatter demand curve was the elastic demand. It's the same thing with this. And look, uh, and look a little bit at the size of the change, right? For a flat supply curve, I don't have much in terms of an increase in price, but I've got a much, much, much larger increase in quantity supplied, right? If I divide a big number by a small number, that's when my value is going to be greater than one. If it's less than one, that's inelastic, right? Just like with a steep demand curve, a steep supply curve is, a, is an inelastic supply. And again, we're thinking about for the inelastic steep supply curve, it took a huge increase in price. And what did producers do? They barely, barely were able to bring any additional units to the market. To finish out the list, unit elastic for when it's equal to one, perfectly When it's equal to zero, those are the low numbers. Perfectly inelastic supply is when my supply curve would look like what? Perfectly inelastic supply is going to be perfectly up and down. Perfectly elastic supply are when flat is elastic. It's perfectly flat supply. So how do we think about this? What determines the own price elasticity of supply? I think this is a useful way to think about it. So let's assume that we've got, I'm going to add the demand. Let's assume that we've got two different markets and both of those markets experience an increase in the demand in this market. On the left, we've got an increase in the demand for this product. What happened? prices barely nudged up. But what did increase a lot was the amount that producers were able to bring to the market and sell. Whereas on the right, when I've got the steeper supply curve, demand goes up. Consumers found this thing more valuable. Prices went up a whole lot. And what did producers do? They were barely able to bring additional units to market. And that's really what the difference is between elastic and inelastic. It's how easily producers can expand their production. So think about two different, two different potential um, 
potential goods. So let's assume that there's an increase in the demand for coffee. Let's The easiest way to think about this is the change in preferences. So what if coffee, um, it, the, we found out that coffee uh, cured cancer. What's going to happen to the to the market for coffee? There's absolutely going to be an increase in the demand for coffee. We've also got, uh, we I like think about athletic events usually, and I think about um, places like NC State where I did, did my grad work, right? They're not usually good, but when they're good, what happens to the demand for tickets to their, their different sporting events? Yep, there's going to be an increase in the demand for for those kinds of products, right? Between these two different markets, there's an increase in preferences. Consumers want to buy more of them. But which of those markets looks more like coffee and which looks more like an athletic event, right? Again, the question is, how easily can producers ramp up their production? If you, if coffee producers, coffee shops saw a whole bunch of people flood into their market, I'm going to argue that, yeah, what are they going to be able to do? all that increased demand, they're going to be pretty easy. It's going to be pretty easy for them to start ramping up their production and meet that additional demand. I don't think there's going to be much upward pressure on prices. However, for something like a stadium, that's <laughs> right. It's got limited seating. It takes a while um, to add more seating. So if suddenly one of uh, if if one of these NC State teams that usually doesn't do very well started doing better, right? There's going to be an increase in demand. Can they very easily accommodate a, a whole bunch more fans that show up and want tickets? Nope. They're barely going to be able to sell additional units. Um, because they've got this physical constraint where they can't really ramp up their production that much. And so what's going to happen is instead of increasing the volume, instead of increasing the quantity, they're going to they're going to handle that increase in demand by increasing the price in the market. So really, that's the key way to think about whether supply is elastic or inelastic, whether it's steep or flat, is just really how easily can producers ramp up their production.